thank you, Peter, and it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I've been at the Simons Institute for various programs uh, since its inception, and I think it's valuable in bringing the community, you know, bringing the not only the theory community and looking at interfaces with uh, practice and, uh, you know, broadening the horizon overall, not only at Berkeley, but uh, research everywhere else as well. Uh, and so today, I want to like give a more broader high level view of where we are uh, with machine learning, especially when it comes to, you know, like the lessons we've learned uh, in academia and in theory, how much of that uh, is really transferable to practical deployments in industry, right? So what are the gaps and what are ways we can try to overcome that? Um, because in my academic career, I've had, uh, uh, the pleasure and you know like also the privilege in some sense to really work on uh, uh, deeply theoretical interesting problems um, especially in tensor methods how we can take linear algebra to more dimensions and what uh, uh, kind of theoretical problems that uh, were previously not po possible to solve could be solved with these uh, tensor methods uh, and indeed under what conditions is that possible Right, uh, but now are these assumptions or conditions are they valid in practice? You know, what kind of problems are can be really tackled not only with tensor methods but broadly with algorithms we analyze in theory? And what are the other pillars? I mean, in academia and in research in general, we spend a lot of time on algorithms. You know, really kind of uh, getting the last bit of performance. You know, proving tight bounds and all that's really valuable work. But in addition, we need research also on the other two pillars, that's data and compute, right? Because when it comes to uh, doing AI or machine learning at scale um, in a practical setting, we need all these three, right? So most of the academic research happens on data that's a benchmark. You know, ImageNet is the most popular computer vision benchmark, and similarly you have in other domains as well. And so we keep repeatedly trying to improve that and there are indeed a lot of problems with that uh, approach, right? We would you know, end up over, inevitably overfitting on those benchmarks. And also we miss the um, problems that are involved with the data collection itself. And then the other pillar is infrastructure. I mean, like this uh, compute was really, uh, you know, neural networks have been around forever, right? So we, and there is, a lot of theoretical contributions much before we could get them to deploy. And the uh, main advance was really in compute and data, right? Whereas we have the simplest algorithms currently being implemented at scale in these deep neural networks. So how we can also think about the interface of systems and machine learning. Is there new research that we can do uh, to further optimize that interface? I mean, there's still lots of, uh, architectures and algorithms we can't implement with our current technology. Can we f further try to close that gap by thinking about what are the different uh, compute infrastructures and how we can uh, you know, think of designing algorithms, but more importantly, build the software frameworks that will enable people to try it out and further innovate. And that's kind of my broad message from this talk that how we can bring all this together. So when I go further into what you know, problems we want to think when it comes to data, right? So, so the very first question is if you don't have the data, you have to collect it, right? So uh, as I said, most of our theory is with the uh, IID samples, the train and the test distributions being the same, but that's hardly ever true in practice. So we have to and collect the data and maybe what we collect and train our model is very different from how we test it or where we deploy the model. So how do we uh, overcome those problems? The other one is like when you're collecting the data and you want to do learning uh, with labels, you have to have human annotators. It's typically you know, human labeled data that we would need to have. And so the standard paradigm is to have multiple uh, crowd workers, so if you're hiring people to label data, there's going to be noise. Uh, so you need to aggregate this data from different crowd workers, right? So, I mean, there's a lot of time and effort spent in uh, 
you know, getting these crowd workers, are aggregating information from them? Uh, are there ways to optimize there? Right? And finally, like, you know, when I say augmentation, usually, you know, people think of simple things like if it's a, a computer vision application, crop the image, add some noise, right? But this is very simple kind of way to prevent overfitting. Like if you have, uh, you know, if you're training on a set of uh, examples, you can tend to overfit and what are ways to regularize for that? But are there more sophisticated mechanisms, right? So how we can, uh, you know, build more information about what what is the process in which these samples are generated? What is the domain knowledge we have? I mean, if this is a particular domain from which the data is collected, what additional knowledge can we bring in, right? Can we do more sophisticated data augmentation? And what does theory tell us and what does practice tell us? So uh, those will be some of the topics uh, that I'll cover. So I will spend a lot of time on the data side, but I want to bring up like the main issues uh, that I've been working on on the other two pillars as well. So as uh, Peter mentioned, uh, when it comes to algorithms, a lot of my uh, time and effort has been spent on thinking about multidimensionality, like how with uh, tensors we can go beyond linear algebra and what kind of problems will it solve that a matrix decomposition or matrix method cannot. Right, so I will kind of skip most of that in this talk, uh, but I'm happy to kind of talk offline about it. But I will talk about a more recent work on the optimization side. Um, you know, so there's uh, a lot more work on convex optimization because that's something we can analyze very well in theory. We can get really sharp bounds. But now with the, the deep neural networks being almost you know, in, in so many applications, there's the need to also push the theory for non-convex, right? So, so non-convex is almost a misnomer because that's everything that's not convex. So that really doesn't help us, right? So that'll include all the hard problems. So now the question is, we can ask, okay, what are the conditions under which we can prove some desirable or nice bounds and uh, guarantee success in some form? Uh, but then, you know, in practice, can we go and check those conditions? Like the prop popular problems and popular uh, frameworks we are using uh, in practice, do they satisfy those conditions? And what intuitions do we gain from that theory? And so today I'll show you uh, how a simple uh, gradient compression scheme uh, where you just take a sign of the gradient and uh, use this for a distributed optimization setting uh, you can analyze convergence rates in theory, but also in practice, uh, we show how you can get almost the same accuracy as the full SGD model, uh, but uh, you can save a lot on throughput, right? You can be much more efficient um, and faster in getting that answer. Uh, so that kind of also relates to, as I said, the infrastructure side, like you, you know, are there algorithms in machine learning that we can uh, exploit better from our compute infrastructure uh, because a lot of traditional hardware and compute was designed to do exact computation, to do high precision computation, uh, to really have redundancy and reliability. But maybe machine learning doesn't need all that heavy uh, you know, infrastructure. Maybe there are lighter forms of uh, hardware and infrastructure that could be better suited. Right, so there's a lot of open problems in that area. And, um, you know, indeed on the infrastructure side, uh, I won't give a whole lot of details in this talk, but there are a lot of uh, questions, right? So at the base level, like uh, there is the, the GPUs have become the workhorse of uh, deep learning. And the main reason is, you know, CUDA and the possibility of uh, parallel computing at scale. Right, like being able to really be efficient on uh, matrix computation-like operations, those that can be parallelized very well. And as you know, deep neural networks consist of mostly those operations, and hence uh, we've been able to deploy them at scale. Uh, but even there, there are questions of, can we go beyond the current primitives that exist there, and can we think of, you know, what's the, 
kind of natural for me is to ask uh, what are the tensor primitives or higher order primitives that could make it even uh, better. So there are a lot of interesting questions there on what uh, um, you know, hardware primitives can help us realize uh, uh, different machine learning methods. And that's kind of like on the platform layer, right, where you want to be able to uh, use this compute and easily design different neural network architectures, quickly define you know, different uh, models you want to run and be able to um, just easily deploy them at scale without worrying about the lower level primitives. And uh, frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch have been very important to you know, make this jump, right? Otherwise, earlier when it came to doing research, it was just very hard and complex to do all this programming. So this abstraction helped a lot. And then in industry, what's really happening and emerging is to build applications on top of it. So make it even easier uh, uh, in terms of consuming the results of machine learning. So you have the recognition API from AWS or uh, the Vision API from Google Cloud, or you have the automotive drive service from NVIDIA. So these are all services that you know, are either for one application or one domain, and the machine learning models are pre-trained and uh, they're serving different customers, right? So, so as you can imagine here, many of the fundamental assumptions we make in our machine learning theory is violated uh, because the model is trained on a different data than where it is served, and maybe you want to serve different customers with different needs. So there are a lot of new interesting problems we can ask also from the theoretical angle on how to tackle such scenarios. Um, so overall, that's kind of the theme of how all these three pillars uh, come together and what we can do to put, all, you know, have a unified thinking of all of them. And by the way, feel free to interrupt me. I like this to be interactive, uh, just how I like my machine learning as well. So. <laughs> So feel free to ask questions uh, anytime. Great. Um, so now let's go further into uh, the data part. So what are some uh, mechanisms to make our uh, uh, first data collection more efficient and ultimately also our algorithms more sample efficient? So the first aspect is how we can uh, you know, learn actively and learn with different kinds of simple feedback uh, compared to standard passive learning and full feedback. And uh, as I said, the more emphasis is on how in uh, more you know, common uh, empirical problems, how much of savings do we get from um, some of the simplest schemes, right? So there's indeed uh, long um, uh, research being done in each of this, uh, but the focus is uh, how this is uh, helping improve uh, the latest deep learning models and what lessons do we learn from that. Uh, so as I said, the second part will be on aggregation. If you have multiple crowd workers, how do you aggregate the data and um, you know, uh, get a good machine learning model? So typically, what's the um, kind of uh, standard thinking? Here, you would, like, you, know, you would like your each data sample to be as noise free as possible. So that's why you have many annotators per sample, so you try to uh, reduce the noise in each sample. Right? But what we'll show is this is not needed if you ultimately want a model that's trained well. So you can get away with a lot of noise at each sample level. And so there are good, uh, as long as you can also incorporate the label noise into your overall framework, this is okay. And then in the last part, as I said, I'll cover how with generative modeling, you can do better semi-supervised learning uh, and also think about how to, you know, how does generation and prediction kind of go with each other, right? So mostly we think about supervised learning, we think about prediction. Uh, generation is a much harder problem. Uh, and usually that kind of the two areas are decoupled, right? But we'll try to, couple them together and ask, is there a model that both jointly generates and predicts and does well in prediction? I mean, always you can use one model to do the other, but to do it well is the key. And then in the second part, it'll be more about asking, can we use, incorporate the domain knowledge as well into our learning? And we'll do it in a very specific form, 
if there are symbolic rules or expressions, how do we use that uh, to also incorporate in our kind of function approximation kind of paradigms, right? So there is additional information, not just an input and output uh, framework for learning. So what can be done there? So that's the broad ideas like, uh, you know, when, uh, uh, so these are the three stages, right? You want to collect the data, then you want to clean up uh, the data and make it ready for machine learning. And ultimately, when you're uh, uh, learning, you want to augment it, because without that, you end up overfitting. Almost in practice, if you, no matter how good your data is, most likely you would have to do additional augmentation. Just by itself is not enough, right? It's uh, it's something simple like dropout or some regularization, but uh, you know, can it be more sophisticated? And that's what uh, these areas will explore. Great. So now, um, you know, so what does active learning give us? So what is the basic idea of active learning? Right. So you know, instead of just going and labeling all the examples, we are asking, you know, can you tell me what examples will be most useful? Uh, for uh, training this model, right? And intuitively, it's, it'll be those examples where the current model is uncertain about. So the most basic uh, active learning algorithm goes through uncertainty sampling. So you have a current m uh, model that is trained, and then you look at uh, how certain is this model on these you know, uh, new unlabeled samples. And the, then you take only the uncertain uh, samples, label them, retrain the model, and do this again and again. So this is uh, the most uh, popular form of active learning. You know, there are uh, positive results as well as negative results for that, right? And then there are more sophisticated ones. So our first question was, um, you know, how will this work uh, with uh, uh, some of the you know, standard deep learning frameworks? And then the other question was, you know, when could this possibly fail and uh, what else can we do there? So for the first part, uh, what we took was this task of named in, yeah. Oh. What does SOTA stand for? Uh, uh, state of art. Sorry? The state of the art, like the, the, the best yeah. previous, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, an abbreviation. So yeah, so can you reach? the best performance, but with a smaller data set. Thank you. Any others? Yeah. Yeah, so the named entity recognition is a sequence tagging task. So you have text, you want to ask, you know, can I tag whether each uh, uh, piece of, uh, each uh, token or a word is uh, what entity it is, and uh, whether it's an entity and what type it is, right? So there are standard, uh, uh, neural network models for this. I won't go into it. We also did some innovations on the architecture side, but uh, the details are in the paper. Uh, but the main kind of you know question was, uh, you know, so we did the least confidence uh, sampling. So in this case, we were taking sentences, right? And so we were asking, okay, we'll take this sentence with the least confidence and we'll go ahead and label it. And we simulated the labeling. Uh, on this uh, biggest open benchmark, what's called onto nodes. And so that was the least uh, confident sampling. The other was normalizing it for the length. So the intuition is longer sentences will all, you know, always tend to have the lower confidence. Right? If you have more words naturally, the confidence of tagging all of them correctly will be uh, lower. Uh, so instead, if we normalize for the length, then we can, you know, because the effort is usually at the token level if you go and ask the annotator. So we felt this was a fairer uh, heuristic for uh, saying which, uh, you know, how to label it better. And so what we see here is the, you know, so the main result is you can get away with much smaller number of samples uh, uh, to get the state of the art result. So if you actively sample with very simple least confidence or normalized least confidence uh, heuristics, you can do with just 25% of the original data, right? And so that's that's nice. So you know, like deep learning, you think requires a lot of samples, but with active learning, there's a potential to reduce it further. And then the other question was, I mean, in, like shallow models do, you know, can work very well with uh, small amount of data. So 
and deep models require more. But if deep models have the you know, freedom to do this active uh, uh, sampling, then can, can it beat the shallow model? At what number of samples will it beat that? And it turns out that with very little data, the deep model is already beating the shallow one. Right? And even when the shallow model is given all the data, so we were more than fair to the shallow model. Yeah, so possibly. I mean, there's a slight, like, kind of, yes, going above the curve. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, it's, it's a good question, right? So it is kind of, you know, like it is following a different optimization path. Uh, so, so possibly it's doing better, at least in that case it is. Uh, but more universally, I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was like a CRF. It was like this. You know the best one in for that problem that uh, I forget the details, but it's the kind of the one that people use the most before deep learning came about. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so you know, like the popular wisdom is when there is less data, do classical machine learning. Only if you have more labeled data, do deep learning, right? But uh, that could be overcome if you have the ability to query actively and label actively, uh, then uh, there is the potential of making deep learning work even with less data. So that was the um, kind of uh, finding from this uh, work that uh, you know, it's possible to drastically reduce this. But there's also a corollary that I want to point out that this was on a you know, popular benchmark. And um, all these benchmarks, right, like kind of we are currently judging only based on the size of it. Like this was the largest one, so people think this is the most difficult benchmark. Uh, but uh, what this was saying was really the, you know, the kind, the amount of information present in this, right? The 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 amount that active learning requires is like a surrogate of like the diversity of this benchmark, right? It gives you a, a point of measure for that. So so maybe this would be another, you know. Uh, outcome of uh, using active learning is to be able to judge which uh, benchmark data sets are actually diverse and good. So uh, because if you have like a lot of difficulty uh, on this data set, maybe you do, even if you're doing it actively, you would end up requiring more samples. So that's something to think about, yeah. Could you say a little more about 25%? Because I, I'm not an expert at this, but if I took every fourth word in a text, such as the one you showed about Einstein. Uh, that would be very different from taking every fourth sentence or every fourth letter. So you take 25% take of the data. Right. So you had an article. Yes. I can take 25% in many different ways. Sure. I mean, so so the way we did this was, uh, you know, so we are actually like kind of doing mini batch training. So you do have like the old data and then, you know, you're not like looking at all the unlabeled one, right? So that's not efficient. So so we are instead like kind of randomly subsampling and within that choosing like, you know, the... Is so the sentences or letters or words? Uh, words. Words. Yes. So, so it's, it's like that's where the labeling, you know, the the cost is in terms of the words. And so because that's how it's done in NLP. So that was the takeaway with this, that active learning can potentially reduce and also have a mechanism to evaluate uh, the diversity of data sets. So the next work, what we asked was, that's great that we do selection of data actively, but can we also select the questions and the kind of feedback actively? Right, so typically if you have a large number of classes in practice, you would need some structure. And the hierarchy is the most natural one in many cases. For instance, in ImageNet, you have a hierarchy of the classes, right? So you have like kind of, whether it's an animal or not, and then a dog and so on. So you, ha you know, you're given this hierarchy, and that's how you send this out to the annotator, right? So you're asking binary questions to the annotator, and that way you get to the finest uh, category, uh, because it's like if you think of a user interface, you can't just like have a drop-down menu and just give all the finest categories and ask them to pick one, right? So the only one that's feasible with a large number of classes is uh, through binary questions of a hi hierarchy. 
And so if that's the setup, then we can ask, uh, you know, can I now, uh, you know, actively select what to ask the user, right? So, so indeed, like as you know, a mich you're learning something more, it would be wasteful to ignore that. So if the model is already confident that this is an animal, you can then ignore this first set of questions and directly drill down further, right? So, so you want to figure out where in the hierarchy you're reasonably confident and where the b best reduction in uncertainty is, right, by choosing that. And the other thing is to be more, um, you know, like saving in resources, you know, you don't have to wait to label your sample completely. You can now say, let me go actively find another sample, ask another question, and keep moving on. So I can keep just getting partial answers on each uh, data point, but then I'm training the model, right? So ultimately, with the model, I can go back and la label all my training examples, my tr test examples, and so on. And so, the, so this was the question, like, how much saving can we get by doing both data and feedback actively? And it turns out it's quite a lot you can save. Uh, so, with, uh, so the LO curve is with both data and questions uh, actively. And you can see, like, that was more than, it was higher accuracy. So we even got, like, kind of similar to the earlier uh, point, right? Like active learning could also help you get better accuracy. So we're getting higher accuracies here, but also with less number of questions or feedback. So at just 30% of the questions compared to a passive uniform sampling. So, and then there are the intermediate schemes. So what, yeah. So we used a number of uh, different mechanisms, ultimately like kind of entropy, you know, uh, or uncertainty ones. There was not that much of a difference between them. Uh, so it's kind of like, you know, ultimately like kind of, they were all having similar performance. I mean, so these are like kind of, uh, you know, so on this ImageNet data set, right, so this is like reaching the, the same as you, as you had like kind of 100% of the samples, right? So, so that's the best performance on this, like a subsample. Uh, on this data set, yes, on this kind of subsampled ImageNet. Um, and then, you know, we can further scale up and ask what it is on a bigger one, yeah. Yeah. Right, so here, so far, we have only like kind of simulated labeling, right? So now if it is a real system, there's the latency of sending out the data, and then it's the question of like, okay, how much of the pool of data do I send? And there's also learning is now with mini batches, right? So there's continuous learning as well, so can you, try to merge those streams. So there are a lot of like systems questions as well of how do you design that whole mechanism. And, and that's why like kind of even now there isn't like kind of a nice mechanism to do it online, right? So most of it is, you know, it's all offline right now. And so there is latency, but there are, you know, there is potential, so there are, that's an open problem. Great. So that was on the, uh, you know, the takeaway from the active learning side that when possible, you know, if active learning is possible, uh, do, you know, go for it, like uh, go actively label your data, but also actively ask your questions. And don't wait to completely label your each data point, but keep moving on, and that way you can learn faster. And uh, so since then, my collaborator, Zach Lipton at CMU has further investigated Right, like the question of transferability of uh, actively collected data. So if you are now have this data set that's collected actively for one task, how transferable it is, right? And the other question is, if you are doing active learning in practice, you cannot set the hyperparameters you know, many times on the same data set, right? But, I mean, the main challenge is to prevent overfitting. 
so which active learning methods are less prone to overfitting and which ones are not. And it turns out like a more Bayesian framework, a Bayesian disagreement framework is more robust when you also do extensive experimentation. Uh, although like in these limited ones, the two didn't show that much of a difference. And that's why there's a need to always kind of keep doing further empirical studies to really tease out the differences between different algorithms. So that was on the active learning side. The next question we asked was on the crowd side. Like if you now have a uh, you know, set of crowd workers giving you labels, uh, you know, some people can be expert in one category, another on a different one, right? So they can be error prone. Uh, and so how do you merge all their answers? So the most standard thing is to take the majority rule. Like, you know, it's the wisdom of the cloud and uh, you go with that. Uh, we've just seen that play out uh, in politics and it's always not <laughs> uh, the best thing. But, and so probably, you know, maybe majority is not the uh, right thing to do, right? So can we do, uh, what, what are the other alternatives? So what people usually do in practice is to have like a gold standard data set, a small amount of labeled samples that is done by experts so that you know that's correct and then use the crowd workers and then try to evaluate how good they are, right? But even this has a disadvantage because you only can evaluate on a small number. So really the, you know, this is a latent variable um, uh, estimation problem because we don't know what the ground truth label is, right? We don't know what the correct answer is. Uh, so we have all these noisy labels from uh, the crowd workers, how do we estimate both the ground truth and as well as the confusion matrices of the crowd workers. So, so how do we do both at the same time? So I mean, one kind of simple starting point is maybe you start, like, you know, you look at the disagreement with the majority and then try to improve it, right? So if you ask, like, how far are you from the majority, that'll give you, like, a accuracy of each worker, and then based on that, you... Uh, you know, you can try to do that. And that's what some of the previous works did. But this is still a problem because you're going with the majority. So let me just uh, come to what we did. So what we instead did was, you know, the main intuition is we ultimately want our machine learning model to be good, right? Our machine learning model should be close to the ground truth labels. So if we get to a point where we have very good estimates of how accurate the crowd workers are, as well as a good machine learning model, then, you know, then we have achieved our goal. So at that point, you can ask the machine learning model, is this crowd worker correct or not, right? So, so we can like play this game of iterative learning, where in the beginning, we're gonna pretend that all the crowd workers are perfect, and then based on that, train our machine learning model. And then we'll ask the machine learning model, how is each crowd worker differing from your answer? Right, so that's your current estimates of the uh, errors made by the crowd worker. So you can use that to do a weighted loss minimization. So you can go back and forth like this. And so the idea is, you know, if you start at a reasonably good point, you can improve each other. So your estimate of how good the crowd workers are improves, and your machine learning model also improves. So overall, you will get better, right? And that's kind of what we showed both in theory and in practice. So in theory, our, uh, the question we addressed was, suppose you have a fixed budget, you know, like the amount of annotations you get is fixed, right? Do you allocate more workers for each sample or do you label more, right? So what the traditional wisdom was, you really want more workers for each sample because you really want it to be noise free. But here in our framework, we are incorporating the label noise into our framework. We are doing this iterative mechanism. So we are incorporating that, you know, we are aware there is label noise, right? So in that setting, it turns out that having just single annotation per sample is okay. So even if it's error, error prone, it's okay. Overall, you will uh, train a good model with that, you, which will generalize well. And that's what we found in practice as well. So here again, the main challenge was really getting a data set then, you know, like the theory was great, but getting the data set was the challenge because most open data sets throw away 
you know, the information about who the, uh, how, you know, which annotators labeled what and who the annotators are. Whereas for Microsoft Coco, we got this information and that's how we could show the improvement. Yes. So this is right. So the, the theory here, you are assuming like you know uh, how the crowd workers are. You know this is a this is still a simplistic assumption, right? So you are saying that the crowd workers are making independent errors, and uh, you have a predictor in the class that is good, right? That's uh, that's accurate. So yeah, I'm close to that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like nearly, like kind of the probability we have like thresholds and we have different settings. So there, you know, so there is indeed a set of assumptions, and there's always room to further improve that. Yeah. So the main, uh, you know, kind of outcome of this was to, you know, potentially like take, you know, design a better uh, framework that is aware of how the data collection and aggregation is happening, right? Instead of keeping that separate from machine learning training, you're combining that. And because of that, you can save a lot in the number of samples. You can save a lot in the annotation efforts. So that was kind of the outcome of this. So I'll kind of the rest of it. I'll be much quicker because I realize I'm, you know, uh, coming uh, closer to the times. But I want to give you some, you know, high-level intuitions of uh, what we can do uh, uh, in these frameworks. So the generative modeling, uh, you know, the GAN or generative adversarial networks have been the popular class so where, you know, there's uh, like feedback you're getting on whether an image is fake or not using another discriminator you're training, and based on that, you're trying to generate, right? But this has a lot of issues. I won't go into it, but kind of my primary goal, as I said, is to do data augmentation. So I want to be able to you know, better regularize the data, better come up with even training mechanisms for supervised learning or semi-supervised learning. And so how do we do that? So the main idea was kind of, can we have one model to do both, right? So the generative model is like trying to generate for each category, you know, like what the image is, if it's an image example. So the prediction is given the image, what is the label? Right, so we want to like kind of ask: Is there one model that is good in both? Right, so, and that's a hard one indeed to generate. It is really hard because you're losing information when you try to go from image to label. So, so what we wanted to ask was, uh, uh, you know, for prediction, we know that convolutional neural networks are the state-of-art models for computer vision. So is there a generative model such that when we you know, do inference in this model, can we recover the convolutional neural network? Right? What is the mechanism that allows that? Right? So the, basically, the idea is now you're going from your object category to the image, and you're going through intermediate steps of rendering. Right? But indeed, this process is not going to be certain. Right? It's not deterministic, because if you say a dog, there are all possible kinds of dogs. Right? So you do want to have uh, random variables, but the key is how do you design these l random variables. And um, so the main, sorry. So the main idea is we try to reverse the convolutional neural network. Right? So when you think of what the convolutional neural network is doing, it's doing convolution, then it's doing like pooling, which reduces the dimension, and then there's some nonlinearity and so on. So whereas in generation, you're going from now a coarse resolution to a finer resolution. So that's you're increasing the dimension. And in the process, what you're doing is you're introducing random variables, because this is not a reversible process. Right? You can, when you do max pooling, you're you know, losing information. But you can ask, what is the prior distribution that will you know, kind of mirror this, that will reverse this? And so that's how we design a structured prior for generating. So the details are in the paper. I mean, in, we, in fact, also come up with a better training mechanism for this. Uh, but you know, the main intuition is we can now regularize better. So if we now have a model that's both trying to predict, but also we are looking at 
you know, optimizing for likelihood for generation, you know, intuitively there is a better regularization mechanism that's happening. And it turns out that it also gives rise to a generalization bound that depends on the generation process. So if you assume for the class of models that uses this generative process, so what's a good generalization is a model that has a small number of rendering paths. So you have a small number of paths to actively render. And so you can also you know, come up with uh, kind of you know, questions on what are uh, bounds that will be for this specific class of distributions you know, that kind of can give more insights on how we design this. And in fact, this will give us a new form of regularization that also improves in practice. Right, so, so the main idea here was to really um, you know, think of this point that uh, you know, we usually do only the convolutional network or a feed forward network, but can we also simultaneously have a, uh, another feedback network that will, you know, that will kind of correspond to each other. It's a probabilistic distribution such that when you do inference, you recover your convolutional network. And so it's coupling the two and uh, you know, it does the state of the art in semi-supervised learning with that mechanism. And so there's lots of opportunities, I think, to ask, can we do better generative modeling by utilizing such information? Any questions here? Uh, so it's not great for visual I uh, know, uh, kind of uh, quality, right? Because that was not the goal of this. The goal was to ask, uh, you know, whether we can. So I believe we would still need adversarial loss to improve uh, visual uh, quality, but uh, but it improved the results in terms of semi-supervised learning. Yes. Yes, uh, so it's uh, injected at each level. So the main um, intuition is, so you know, you kind of decide in each activation whether you want to copy it down or not, right? So what we call render forward. And then, you know, the reverse of max pooling is like a translation process. So you, you want to like randomly decide where you want to translate within a box. Uh, so it's really like kind of now you're, you know, so if you think of it, that's kind of like reversing the ReLU and the max pooling. So it's uh, uh, so that's what's happening at each level, and then there is a prior that kind of jointly models all those latent variables at all the layers. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, so this is likelihood, right? So we'll optimize for the likelihood. Great. Uh, so, so that was, uh, you know, so that's how we can, you know, think of uh, g design of generative models to uh, do better su semi-supervised learning as well as better supervised learning. Right. So, in the other framework, the main kind of what was the main idea? The idea was if you try to learn each function by itself, you would need enough samples, right? And not just that, you're just doing interpolation. You can only tell what's in between. You can't extrapolate. But if you want to learn an entire domain of functions, I mean, now what people call meta-learning, I mean, a lot of things are meta-learning. Maybe this is also meta-learning, right? So you learn an entire domain of functions, then you can utilize more information, right? Really, how these functions are related to one another. And think of very simple things, like maybe the class of trigonometric functions and some basic algebra. Right, so there's lots of, you know, we can, we have the basic axioms and then based on that we can generate all kinds of symbolic relationships between them. Right? But how do we have both, you know, symbolic relationships as well as just numerical data? Like you look at how the function is at different points. Can you do both together and what is the benefit of doing that? And so what we see here is, uh, you know, you can use three LSTMs, so these are frameworks that you know, try to have the hierarchy and then learn um, like an embedding at each level of the hierarchy, right? So if you have like kind of now symbolic equations, like sine squared plus cos squared is one, you can write it as a symbolic tree, right? Usually we don't think of numbers as trees, 
right? But in reality, they are if you think of a decimal representation or any base representation, right? So you can also represent numbers through like the operation of trees. And so, and now if you're evaluating functions, that's also a tree, right? So you're kind of um, incorporating like each set, step in the process of either evaluating a function or representing a number as a tree. And so all these operations have commonalities across these uh, different trees, right? And that's what we want to try to learn. So, so when we say multiplication or power or all this, right, it has the, you know, we know what it is because we've designed it, right? But if the neural network has to learn it just from data, it will figure out, oh, it's doing something common across these different data types and different examples. So that way it's able to learn the common relationships. Right, so here the point was not to program these functions, right, but if you can just learn it just based on a few axioms and numerical data. And it turns out that uh, by encoding it this way, by also thinking of numbers through trees and expressions through trees, you can ask about generalizing to a higher depth. So if you only train on trees up to, let's say, depth three, and you wanna test on functions of depth four, that's a harder problem. Right, typically, we don't do that in machine learning. Uh, we think of the train and the test as similar distributions. But because we are doing meta-learning on this entire class of functions, it turns out that you can, it's possible to do this with reasonably high accuracy. And so the main message is by thinking about how to, what are the common structures across different kinds of information and data you have, it may be possible to learn better. And, and that's what this work showed. That indeed, like by learning all the functions together, you can get much better evaluation of functions, right? But also, more importantly, you can also improve your symbolic evaluation. So, if you are giving numerical data to your model, it's more evidence of these symbolic relationships. So, you can also further evaluate functions better, and this evaluation was done on a higher depth. So, you are also able to, I mean, ultimately, right, you want to reason about harder problems by training on simpler ones. Uh, but you know our current machine learning is very bad on those. Uh, so this is one mechanism, at least in this setting, where you can represent uh, functions uh, and your input as trees. It's possible to be modular and try to learn better. So that was the kind of the message of this work. Any quick questions here? Yes. Right. I mean, it should be both, right? <laughs> that's that's kind of my goal to really, you know, talk about both the uh, you know sites and or the what are the gaps and how we can try to overcome. Uh, so yes, both sides for sure. Yeah. Yes. And so, I mean, indeed, like that is, on, I mean, this falls in the area of neural programming, right? So there is, so we have some other papers on also learning about code with the abstract syntax trees and more. Uh, so there's some something more you would need to do. But yes, that's the general principle. Yeah. Yeah. One simple application for the Debord discussion is to have simplified the discussion. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, I mean, indeed, that would be, uh, you know, so we didn't evaluate for that, but there are others who kind of, you know, I think followed up and did that. Yes, indeed, that would be a, you know, that would be an application of this. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, and, and now we are doing other things like PDEs and other solvers. The question is, can we add both symbolic, you know, information as well as numerical data and some, you know, some methods are known, some are, un, you know, just based on numerical evaluation, right? So there are lots of or you know things we can take it further from this example. Yeah. yeah. So are we really okay? Was it not five ten? It was five. Was that the okay? So so given that this is the very end, let me just very quickly go to the end. Yeah, so one is like, you know, I just wanted to 
you know, if you have a call out on uh, uh, what I've recently started doing at NVIDIA, there is a lot of uh, uh, rich, um, you know, research environment there. Um, traditionally, it's been more on graphics and architecture and hardware and programming. Uh, but now there's a lot of interest for machine learning, robotics, computer vision. So I just joined two weeks ago, but there's also others like Dieter Fox, Sonia Fiddler, who are recent hires. So there's uh, really a lot of um, you know push towards uh, open publishable research as well as to look at interdisciplinary research across all different areas, right? So so if you're interested, I'm definitely happy to chat more. And uh, to conclude, I mean, there is, um, you know, there are mainly three facets uh, we think in uh, machine learning, uh, right? The algorithms is the central pillar when it comes uh, to research and uh, analysis, but data and uh, compute infrastructure are also equally important to get it to uh, practical gains. And so can we think of uh, more research as well, both in theory and in empirical research, that takes all these three into account together, right? So well, I focused a lot on data, primarily because it's also, I would say, the biggest pain point in most industrial applications. So more research on how uh, we can have sample efficient algorithms, how we can have better generalization, uh, better you know, uh, annotation mechanisms, uh, that would be, I think, very impactful. So I didn't talk about the algorithm side, but I encourage you to uh, look up the SINE-SGD paper, which uh, also talks about how gradient compression, which is seemingly lossy in information, can still achieve uh, the same accuracy levels as the full precision stochastic gradient descent, uh, but give you a lot of gains uh, when it comes to throughput. And uh, we also have uh, software frameworks for tensor algebra, uh, tensor Lee or Tensor LY with an LY in the end uh, is the framework that makes it easy for you to add uh, layers with tensor computations into your neural networks, but also to do just tensor computation in NumPy if that's all you want to do, right? So it's an easy front end if you don't like kind of programming all the details, it's uh, there for you to use. And hopefully that'll lead to exploration of more interesting and better architectures for neural networks uh, through tensor algebra. And uh, this work was, and others were possible due to a long list of collaborators uh, that I've worked over the past two years. Uh, so I've been very lucky and happy uh, to have been working with them. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you.